God is a God of fresh starts, new beginnings, second chances. God is a God of glory days. And if you're in need of some glory days, then you're in the right place as we open a study of the story and book of Joshua. God gave Joshua and the Hebrews a second chance at the promised land. And if you're ready to enter the promised land, then you're in the right place. You have an outline in your handout. Keep it handy. You might want to fill in some blanks. Let's pray and we will get to work. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, your presence here today. We believe there is a promised land for us to take and we pray, Father, you would walk us out of the wilderness across the Jordan into the land by your hand that you want us to know. May we receive our inheritance. May we possess our possessions. Please have mercy upon the one who speaks for his sins are many. And may we see Jesus and just Jesus through Christ. We pray. Amen. For seven years they were untouchable. Twenty battles won. Seven king conquers, conquered. 25,000 miles of choice property reclaimed. Seven years of unbridled success. They were outnumbered, but never outpowered. Under-equipped, but never overwhelmed. They were the unlikely, but unquestioned conquerors of the most barbaric armies in history. Had the fight been a prize fight, the referee would have called it in the first round. The Hebrew people were unstoppable. They hadn't always been the Bible doesn't gloss over the checkered history of God's chosen nation. Abraham had too many wives. Jacob told too many lies. Esau sold his birthright. Joseph's brother sold Joseph. Four centuries of Egyptian bondage were followed by four centuries of Wilderness wandering, then later came those 70 years of Babylonian detention. They had their troubles. The Hebrew people built two temples only to lose them both. They were entrusted with the Ark of the Covenant, and no one knows what happened to it. While they were struggling, everybody else was advancing. Babylonia built her cities, Greece flexed her muscles, Rome stretched its empire, but Israel just kept dropping the cheese from the cracker. They couldn't quite get their balance, except during those seven years. The glory days of Israel, this season of success, glistens on the timeline of your Bible right between the dark era of the wilderness wanderings out of Egypt and before the difficult days of the judges. Moses had just died, and the Hebrews were beginning their fifth decade as Bedouins in the Badlands. And sometime right about 1400 B.C., God spoke to Joshua. And Joshua listened to God. And the people listened to Joshua. And they marched. The children of Israel, over two million people, marched into Canaan like harvesters into a Kansas wheat field. And they could not be stopped. Miracles happened. The Jericho walls fell down. The sun stood still. The seven kings of Canaan were forced into early retirement. And by the end of that seven-year campaign, the nation that had been homeless 
became homesteaders. And they had begun farms, villages, and a new era of hope. And their accomplishments were so complete that the historian summarized them with this paragraph at the end of the book. <clears throat> so the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. And not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Three words mark the days of Joshua, power, presence, and possession. During these seven years, the army of Joshua experienced the power of God. They experienced the presence of God. And most of all, they took possession of the land God had promised them. Power, promise, possession. Three huge words in the book of Joshua. I'm wondering, are they huge words in your life? You don't need to cross the Jordan, but boy, you sure do need to get through the week, don't you? You aren't facing Jericho, but you're facing rejection and heartache. You don't look over your shoulder at Amalekites chasing you or Canaanites, but disease or debt. These enemies are rampant. And maybe today you're wondering if you have what it takes to face tomorrow. Maybe you can relate to the little boy I saw recently in an airport. Judging by the flip-flops and the baseball hats, the family was headed on a week's vacation. And judging by the concerned look in the father's face, he was worried if they were going to make the connection. Everything about him said, hurry up, we've got to catch the flight. He was a man on a mission racing down through the concourse of the airport. I wondered if the little boy was going to be able to keep up. The mom could. She was matching her husband stride for stride. The other brothers could, the older boys. They seemed to be doing fine. They just hitched their backpacks up on their back and rode in the draft of their dad and mom. But that little boy <laughs> didn't help matters that he was so young, maybe five or six years of age, had short legs. Didn't help matters that half of humanity, it seemed, was crammed inside the concourse. Didn't help matters either that he was dragging this little backpack on wheels, had Mickey Mouse on the back. He was doing his best to keep up. <laughs> but his parents just get it, getting farther and farther and he was more and more by himself finally I saw him throw his backpack down on the floor right in the middle of a concourse and yell out in the direction of his disappearing family I can't keep up we've all been there life has a way of just getting ahead of us taking the life out of us it's not that we don't try it's not that we don't want to. It's just that we, we run out of steam and we run out of fight. I think the book of Joshua is in the Bible for seasons like that. That the book of Joshua is in the Bible to remind you that no matter where you are in life, your best days can be ahead of you. That there is power, there is presence, and there is a possession. Here's the big message. God has a promised land for you to take. The story of ancient Israel is really divided according to geography. 
Geography is helpful biography when it comes to studying the early days of Israel. Uh, the countries of Egypt, the time in the wilderness, the settling of Canaan, all of these represent the conditions of the people. In Egypt, they were slaves. In the wilderness, they were free from Egyptian bondage, but they weren't free from their own fear. In Canaan, and finally in Canaan, they became people of the possession, people of the promise. They became victorious people. And I would suggest to you that we too have our Egypt and we too have our wilderness and we too have our Canaan. Before we knew Christ, we were in Egypt. We were in bondage to guilt, to sin. We were receiving the consequence of our sin and destined to be penalized for our sin, separated from God forever. We were held back by the leg irons of guilt and human nature. We were held captive, slaves we were, by our fear of death. But then came our Moses, our deliverer, Jesus Christ. And he walked us through the Red Sea. He set us free. He brought down to his knees the Pharaoh, the devil, who sought to destroy us and keep us captive. He released us. And Jesus invited us to enter into the promised land, a time, a season, glory days, if you will, an existence of victory. Now, you may have been taught that Canaan is a metaphor for heaven. You may have even sung some of the hymns that said to Canaan's land, I'm on my way where the soul of man never dies. Well, bless the hearts of those dear hymn writers. But they were wrong. <laughs> Canaan does not represent heaven. It can't. The, 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 the imagery doesn't work. Heaven has no enemies. Ask Joshua if Canaan had any enemies. Heaven has no struggles or battles, but Joshua had at least 20 battles that we know of. Heaven knows no stumbles or struggles, and you'll see as we study the story of Joshua that Joshua's men had both. They stumbled, they struggled, but they won more than they lost. And they had within them a sense of the power of God, and they claimed the promise of God. This is what God offers. Not a land that is void of struggle, but a life that is guaranteed to succeed. God has a promised land, a promised land for you to take, a promised land for me to take. Canaan, then, does not represent the life to come. Canaan represents the life we can have and experience right now. Joshua's story can be your story. What Joshua did, you can do. I believe the book of Joshua is in the Bible to convince you and me to do what Joshua did. Come out of the wilderness into the promised land. God has a promised land for you and me to inherit. And it looks something like this. It is a life in which we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. A life in which we do not lose heart. Can you imagine? A life in which the love of Christ compels us. A life in which we are exceedingly joyful in our, what? Affliction. A life in which we are anxious for nothing, in which we pray always, in which we do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the life God offers to us. In God's plan, in God's land, we win more often than we lose. We forgive as quickly as we are offended. We give as abundantly as we are given. 
We boast only in Christ. We trust only in God. We lean wholly on his power. Most incredibly, we actually do more than Jesus himself. Jesus stunningly said, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do. What an extraordinary statement. But from God's perspective, the normal Christian life is one of victory and breakthrough and success and accomplishment. God invites us to cross over into Canaan. I'm wondering if you're interested. Besides, aren't you weary of the wilderness? You see, just as Canaan represents the victorious Christian life, wilderness represents the defeated Christian life. In the desert, the Hebrew people, they were liberated from Egyptian bondage, but boy, you wouldn't know it to look at them or listen to them, would you? Just three days into their freedom, and the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? A few more days passed. Children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They contended with Moses. They complained against Moses. These people inhaled anxiety like oxygen. They belly ache to the point that Moses actually prayed, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Keep in mind, these people only days before had witnessed the power of God in high definition. Each one of them, each one of them had seen the stages of deliverance. They saw the locusts gobble the crops, the boils devour the skin, the flies buzz through Pharaoh's court. They saw them, God, turn those chest-thumping Egyptians into shark bait right before their eyes. But when God told them, just days later, cross over into Canaan, the 12 spies came back and all but two said it couldn't be done. And those ten who said it couldn't be done actually said, we were like grasshoppers over there. Just tiny, tiny little grasshoppers. They're going to squash us. (laughs) So God gave him some time to think it over. (laughs) He put the whole nation in time out. For 40 years, 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness, out of Egypt, but not out of fear, not free from dread, not free from doubt. They were saved, yeah, but they weren't strong. Consequently, they had this ho-hum time in the wilderness of walking in circles same food every day monotonous humdrum four decades of tedium does that sound miserable does that sound familiar Do you ever sense a disconnect between the promises that you read in the Bible and the reality that you have in your own life? You've read the promises. Jesus promises abundant joy, but you live with this pervasive grief. The epistles speak of grace, and yet you shoulder such guilt. The apostle says we're more than conquerors, and yet it just seems like every day you're conquered again by that same temptation. You ever feel like you're in the wilderness? 
Less than a month ago, I sat down for lunch with a good friend who described his life with wilderness language. Rut. Stuck. Walking in circles. He's a Christian. And he can tell you the day that he was led out of Egypt. But he can't tell you the last time he defeated a temptation or experienced in answer to prayer. Twenty years into his faith, and he battles the same lusts that he did the day of his baptism. He's out of Egypt, but Egypt's not out of him. And he didn't use the words, but I could sense between what he said, this sentiment. I thought the Christian life would be better than this. He did use words like disappointment, disengaged. It's like the doorway to spiritual growth has a secret code and everybody knows it but him. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know who to blame. Some days he blames himself. Some days he blames the church. He thinks about changing congregations, thinks about changing translations. He doesn't know whether to be busier or to slow down or to join a group or get out of a group. He just doesn't know what to do. My friend is not alone in the wilderness. Some years back, the Gallup organization went on a search for people who lead victorious Christian lives. You might call it a search for Joshua's. They wondered what percentage of Christians are actually propelled by their faith? How many believers experience promised land victories on a regular basis? How many Christians, in other words, live like Christians? With an ear toward God, an eye toward heaven, a hand toward the needy, how many would describe their days as glory days? Anybody want to hazard a guess? 13%. Thirteen percent. Nearly nine out of Christians, in other words, languish in the wilderness. Nearly nine out of ten have been disappointed by their faith. Thirteen percent waste away in the worst of ways in the land of in-between. They're out of Egypt, but they're not in Canaan. 13%. If a hospital only released 13% of its patients, if a high school only graduated 13% of its students, if only 13% of investors saw a return on their dollar, if a baseball team only had 13% of its batters ever get on base, wouldn't someone be alarmed? I think the church has a serious problem with getting people into the promised land. I think also the church has an incredible opportunity. 2.8 billion people on our planet call themselves Christians. According to this study, about about 2 billion of those people are languishing or limping along with half their cylinders not working. What would happen, we can only imagine, what would happen if those two billion people went in for a tune-up? How much more joy would be released? How many more prayers would be offered? How many hungry people would be fed? How many marriages would be salvaged? How many people would thrive? How many orphanages would be built? How many orphanages would we need? Could it be that the church's next great mission field is sitting inside the church? And could it be that the greatest project you can face looks at you back from the mirror? Wouldn't you like to cross into the promised land? Think about the Christian you want to be. 
Think about the Christian you want to be, the attitudes and attributes you want to have, generosity, kindness, compassion. Think about the attitudes and habits you want to discontinue. What are they? Endless negativity, unending anxiety, <laughs> criti critical spirit. Here's the big news. With God's help, you can close the gap between the person you are and the person you want to be. With God's help, you can close the gap between the person you are and the person you aspire to be. Glory days await you. With God's help, you can live from glory to glory. And what happened with Joshua can happen with you. Joshua and his men did this. It happened. And they went from dryness to joy. From the barren land to the promised land. From manna to feast. From arid deserts to fertile fields. Yes, they came out of a generation of defeat, but they left behind a legacy of victory. Refugees no longer. They became homesteaders. They inherited their inheritance. They possessed their possession. So much so that it's worth a second read how the historian summarized their victory. So the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to their fathers. They took possession of it and they dwelt in it and the Lord gave them rest all around according to all he had sworn to their fathers and not a man of their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their land. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. <laughs> Wouldn't you love that as your epitaph? It can be. I want you to personalize that promise. You're going to see this verse appear in a reduced version on the screen with all the references to Israel removed. And I've left the word, those phrases blank because I want you to put your name in there. See what I mean? We're going to read this verse out loud. And every time you see a blank, you put your name in there. Okay? Don't be timid. Don't be embarrassed. This is God's plan for you. This is a summary paragraph of the promised land life. You ready? Here we go. The Lord gave to all the life he had sworn to give and took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave Rest all around, and not an enemy stood. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to. All came to pass. Imagine the thought. You at full throttle. You as you were intended. You as victor over Jericho's giants and the troubles of life. You and your promised land life. Folks, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. The enemy never goes down without a fight. But I am saying this. You were made for Canaan. And Joshua's story is in the Bible to show us what God did, yes, but to show us more what God does. And I want to personally invite you not to miss a single weekend in which we study Joshua. Not to miss a single one of the 18 Joshua messages. Yes, 18. It's not a short series. <laughs> By the end of June, I pray that you have discovered a new understanding of the inheritance that God has for you as revealed through this wonderful, powerful, life-changing story in the Old Testament. Are you ready to march? So am I. Let's all be standing. I've written a declaration that we're going to repeat every weekend that we study the book of Joshua. I know this is your first time to read it, but don't let unfamiliarity create timidity. Fill your hearts.
with hope and your lungs with air. Let's make this declaration together. These days are glory days. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true, and his word is sure. These days are glory days. And all the church said, Thank you, Lord, for the promise of second chances, of new starts, and of fresh beginnings. Today we receive that. We choose to hear your promises instead of Satan's lies. We choose to stand on your truth instead of his deceit. And we declare that we are people of God, that we have been bought and brought into the promised land. And now, dear Lord, we seek to inherit our inheritance, possess our possessions, to be the people that you have called us to be. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church said, Amen. Amen.